So I, I think people on the inside get it. Uh, on the outside, I think that they think it's just another graphite company. They don't get the materials and the technology, and they don't realize that we're we're qualifying our materials with car customers now. That that's who our offtakes are with. It's not it's not years down the track. Uh, it's actually happening now. We're very grateful and excited to be joined by the founder and managing director, Mark Thompson. We're going to unpack the Telga opportunity, as well as everything else happening in the electric vehicle space with some insights from the industry. Mark, it's great to have you on the channel. Thanks. Pleasure. Before we dive into everything going on in the Telga story, it might be great to just set that scene of who is the Telga group and most importantly, where are you really trying to fit within the value chain? Yeah, so Telga is a vertically integrated uh, battery materials maker. So predominantly everything made of graphitic material, so graphite that goes into things um, in the batteries. That's the anodes mostly of lithium-ion batteries, but also uh, conductive additives that go into the cathode side. And uh, also we make graphenes as part of that sort of flow, and they can go into industrial products like uh, concrete, uh, paint coatings, um, industrial products. But it's it's all like advanced materials, advanced chemicals, um, company, technology, processing technology, product technology, and owning our own unique graphite source. For sure. And so for those who are potentially not familiar, I think everybody's now familiar with lithium and the excitement surrounding it, but obviously graphite actually by volume makes up such a core component of the lithium batteries. We know that initially mm. graphite, predominantly that industrial use, but obviously the EV sector is rapidly growing. Can you give that insight into why graphite so important within the anode and the opportunities that you're seeing there? <laughs> sure. Well, that was the original original vision was very much that not nearly ninety nine percent of all graphite in the in the lithium ion batteries were were based from from Asia, predominantly from China, uh, in in that supply chain, and that the world would need alternate sub supplies. That was the idea, you know, ten years ago when we started working on graphite, and about four years ago when we first started making our own anode anode materials and, and getting those tested. Um, so graphite makes up about half of the active materials in the battery. So it's by far and away the largest volume of individual material. In, uniquely graphite is not a metal so the way it's made is the shapes and the sizes of it and the internal form of it is make a difference to its performance and so it's quite uh tricky for um new players essentially to to make a, a product that goes all the way to to making the, the final product but i think that what's being missed by the market in general and probably you know by the whole supply chain up to now is that while all anodes are made from mostly graphite at the moment, not all graphite can become anode. So if the particles of graphite are too big or too small or the wrong shape or their internal crystallinity or the way that they lithiate, the lithium goes in and out of them like a sponge, that's how batteries work, rechargeable batteries work, then then the uh, that graphite cannot be used for a battery. So while the crustal abundance of graphite is often quoted as being very large, the amount of material that's available that ends up in the final anode for, for lithium-ion batteries is very, very um, limited, actually, compared to the supply of graphite. And that's why it's a combination of it's critical. It's half the battery, so no graphite, no batteries in the, the global lithium-ion rechargeable sense. Um, but not all graphite can become anode, and so there's a subsection of the graphite world that, that can make battery material while the rest goes into industrial products. And that then brings us to your offering. It starts at one end with Vitangi, a leading global graphite deposit, and then goes all the way through to the anode production, obviously uniquely located within Europe. We know it's one of the fastest growing EV markets as well, very close to customers. You've got great renewables as well back in the project. Can you just talk us through what is that offering and why it's so unique too? Yeah, I think it's, I think, I mean, partially because it's not an accident. This was actually strategized right from the beginning was find a super high grade deposit that could just make anodes because normally what happens is the higher the grade of a deposit, the smaller the particles. And so there's a new technology you have to introduce to, to make battery materials out of it. So if you crack that, what you end up with is um, what is one of the highest grade deposits in the world or currently the number one in, in, in JORC or NI43-101 terms of um, indicated material. And then you have a small footprint of what you're mining. Then the trick is to, to process that material and use it in a way that you get super high yields of anode from it. We don't care about lots of industrial products so much. We, what we want is battery material. So you, you want to liberate, say, have a yield of up around 90% of that material ends up from the ground ending up in the, in the anode of, of the battery and processing technology, which we've developed to do that, which is quite revolutionary, I, I would say, in its, in its abilities. And then to actually make a product 
So you have to have then a sales marketing team, but you also need uh, chemists, you need your own material scientists to actually make a uh, an anode product, which is an active anode product. So it's a shaped, purified and coated particle that's highly engineered um, that fits well, not the battery makers that are starting to get going, not necessarily what used to be yeah, the, the last 20, 30, 40 years historic stuff, but the sort of materials that people are looking for now. So to do that is quite an ambitious undertaking because you have to be a miner, you have to be a metallurgical you know, process sort of whiz have capabilities, but you also need advanced chemical capabilities and the ability to interact with end users who now are not like Traxxas or intermediary sort of groups uh, uh, doing, you know, offtakes and stuff. You're actually dealing directly with cell makers or automotives that front the cell makers. And uh, that's, you know, a, a, that's where the money is. That's where the margins are. That's where the control is. That's where the strategic strength is. Um, and so if you control all that, the idea was that, you know, Talga would be an extremely um, important and, and large player in, in the electrification story in, in lithium-ion batteries. And really all of this is underpinned by Vatangi itself. It's a significant resource, as you mentioned, extremely high grade. It's got that great location. Can you talk the viewers through who might not be familiar with it, just some of those numbers and really the scale of this deposit that you've got? Um, sure. Well, originally, so it starts, it, it's sort of a ring of, of graphite. It used to be a, a flat layer of dead bacteria two billion years ago. It's been pancaked and graphitized at, at depth. And so it's all very evenly graphitized. And then that's been deformed. So you've got a 15 kilometer ring within Batangi of the same material. We've drilled about sort of 10% of that. And that's derived about 30 million tons at 24% graphite. Um, the, the average grade for comparison across sort of China, I guess, if you're down in Shandong and the sort of mid-provinces is around 3%, 3 to 4%. Up in Heilongjiang, they say 10%. There is some nice stuff like that, but it's commonly 5 to 10 um, In Africa, there's grades all the way from like 3% up to, uh, you know, higher, higher grades. They average about 10% as a resource grade. There's certainly some higher um, subsections in there that are substantial. But even still, 24%, grade versus say a grade of 20 percent obviously it's a um you know it's a quarter more essentially contained carbon so it's it makes quite a big difference and then the trick is to have flake sizes which are already battery size so battery battery materials are actually quite small they, they the largest is around 20 micron and the smallest is down around uh five to six um there's a around 10 to 15 is a sort of common market size but there's a trend to go smaller because it charges faster and it works better in uh, different temperature ranges but um so anyway vitengi has these these flakes that are already that size so instead of grinding our graphite down to that size we just have to liberate them which is a bit tricky and then we have to engineer them into the particles the battery guys wants but the vitengi deposit therefore has got um you know 24 20 plus year mine life at the moment um, it can be a lot larger. Unlike the normal history, I think people don't understand this. They think we've been drilling for years and this is as big as it gets. We've actually just been selectively drilling parts of this ring to, to sort of basically support whatever plans we want to put forth. The exploration target, the Jork exploration target is 170 to 200 million tonnes, which at these sorts of grades at 20 to 30% makes it one of the largest contained amounts of graphite on earth. And in fact, that's only one part of a 60 kilometer long chain of graphite deposits we have across there that are all 100% owned. Um, so these are collectively far and away the largest natural graphite resources in Europe and amongst the highest grade in the world. And so uh, being next to road and rail and things like that obviously makes them um, quite valuable, I would say. For, uh, people seem to like that behind our technology and behind the, the products lies this um, sort of resource that you can uh, take advantage of. And then just thinking about how you will be taking advantage of that, obviously the trial mine and then moving forward to 100K tonne of ore, around about 20,000 um, of anode material, and then looking forward 100,000 tonnes of anode material plus moving forward. Can you just talk about that pathway towards production and what you're envisaging? Sure. So the Sweden allows you to do these um, trial mines, uh, which which allow you to get material out for marketing purposes or for testing, you know, of you've got processing tech, you've got product tech and things like that. So we're currently mining 25,000 tonnes of ore from a trial pit, which is going to be processed and go out to customers as part of their qualification ramp ups. Um, the uh, that's about a quarter of actually how what we've applied for for commercial uh, purposes. Years ago, when we started planning what what would be the demand, we actually did not expect the demand to be this strong. Uh, we we've underdone it by quite a long long way. 
but we've put in plans for 100,000 tonnes of ore, which produces about just under 20,000 tonnes a year of anode, which is about 15 to 16 gigawatt hours of battery capacity per annum. So uh, particularly with customers, we just talk about gigs all the time. So the current the current trial mines could produce about four four gigs of, of anode and the full scale is about 16. But 100,000 tonnes a year, it's tiny. And what that gives you is a very, very small footprint, both on the ground and so forth. Now, we are looking to expand it. We've got plans to multiply that by another four times, uh, in fact, to get up to just a total of over 100,000 tonnes of anode production um, per year, which is about 85 gig. But you're talking about in Europe, um, they need... They need uh, uh, up around 800 to 1,000 um, gig of of, uh, of anode. So this would only be less than 10% of that. So again, we're looking at what... So we're starting to look now at what could be the ultimate scale of this project, um, how should it be developed uh, longer term and, and its, its full potential rather than just trying to find market entries because the market now has overtaken what our... We were always market constrained. So we just designed whatever we thought would would fit reasonably, but um, now there's basically no constraint. We've got orders for over one thousand percent of our planned production. Um, I should sorry, I should say expressions of interest um, of our of our production, and uh, that's been published before. I think last year, so um, no surprises there. But yeah, we we clearly are unconstrained now in in uh, just how much the site and Sweden itself wants to make. So we're going for, um, we've currently got permits in for that commercial production that uh, we've got court site visits uh, later on this month, actually in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll be over there for that. And um, we're expecting then in the first quarter of next year, we've got a date where the um, there would be a decision made on the, the permitting. Um, and yeah, so that, that would allow us to potentially start construction next year uh, on pouring concrete. And that's for the mine. There's a mine and a concentrator. And then down in Lulio, there's a refinery site in an, in an industrial area there in a park uh, called Herzfelter, which is getting developed as well, which is where the um, purification and uh, coating and shaping happen. And talking about the demand there, obviously the EVA plant is now up and running, which helps with qualification, particularly to the OEMs. I think you're talking to 40 plus customers at the moment. It'd be fascinating just to hear some insights on the ground about what the demand's looking like and what's everyone really seeking in the EV space. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of demand. Yeah, so I think it's been years in the making that I think it's fair to say that autos and even cell makers weren't that worried about graphite before. It's already It's always been a cheap, relatively cheap part of the battery. So it's a... Um, you know, 10% of the cost. It's not like 40, 50%. And the costs haven't wavered that much. I mean, it's up and down a bit, but not not terribly. Uh, but what they have what they were missing was, it doesn't matter about the, the price level of it. What matters is that 50% of your volume of your active material is that. So so if you don't have it, you don't have a battery. So now they're discovering that the, the, the supply is tightening up and uh, because people are hoovering up all the, all the anode materials and they're finding that they can't, supply um, because it's sort of synthetic as well as natural goes into into anode um, yeah there's constraints and so now they're saying well we we weren't paying attention before now they're, they're paying attention a lot so you're starting to see deals happen obviously with autos and battery makers come through now uh, there's a huge demand now it's pretty difficult to cope with to be honest and there's disappointments where you you cannot discuss with them how much they want oh, they they can't get what they want so you have to you have to constrain different customers in different ways um, to fit their timelines and ours but certainly uh, there's a strong desire for bigger volumes to become available that do not rely on Chinese and the classic supply chains secondly there's a desire for um, it's sort of a split between synthetic and natural some that are addicted to the idea of synthetic and don't care about emissions and don't care about um the, you know the Paris Agreement or whatever else that they, that they they talk about in public, um, but they also uh, are trying to work with natural and introduce more and more natural. And there's others that are willing to go a lot of natural um, as compared to synthetic, because you're going to be able to have new supply chains of that faster and easier and with lower CO two than than synthetics in some cases. So there'll probably be a mix of things. The different customers, I think, probably the only surprises we've found are the blending. Um, a lot of Customers we've found that are, even cell makers want us to do the blends for them rather than they 
they do it. We always assume that they would want to do their own secret recipes and stuff, but they're more willing to get us to do it. Partially, that's a timing issue. That They're also full. They're also busy. So we actually have to go off and often make battery cells for our customers testing our material. So they'll give us their cathode. We have to put our anode with it and get it done by some third party and return the cells to them that they can test, things like that. So there's a surprising amount of interaction um, and there's a surprising amount of what I would say um, is uh, uh, just there's a growing realisation that I thought the car makers and everyone would be onto from a supply point of view years ago, but it's only just occurred to them recently to do with graphite and anodes. Um, but yeah, the EVA, the EVA is fantastic. Again, um, the electric vehicle anode plant we've built in, in Sweden is uh, gives us operational capability, gives us the ability to make our own coated anode materials that are going out to customers. That's what they're qualifying. That's what our discussions are about offtakes. And this is um, yeah, a fantastic facility that will, um, it's still scaling up, frankly, and we uh, is, is already overwhelmed with, with demand and we will... Uh, uh, yeah, so it's a challenge uh, picking and choosing, but certainly, certainly when you look at the demand and the, the constraints on it, you see um, prices are pretty well forecast to go up. Um, as per our DFS that we published um, last year, um, but there's rising prices and then they'll probably plateau a little bit um, as more supply comes on. But there are some constraints on supply, and so it wouldn't surprise me if things uh, do a little bit more like what you're seeing lithium do and, and have a lot more regular higher peaks in between the the off years for sure that makes sense and then i think just a couple of the other pieces as well that investors are always thinking about with Tauga is uh financing and permits you talked a little bit about permitting before but can you just give an update about that and what are the catalysts that investors should continue to look for on both those fronts yeah well well first of all on permitting and there's been a bit of press around lately on permitting in europe which obviously is challenging you're in a first world jurisdiction it's not uh you know you have super um, amounts of uh, rules and regulations as you should and you have a lot of what essentially the only way you'll be allowed to operate is if you has very first class uh, conditions um, and and but if you do you're going to be a long term you're going to be there for 100 years you, you're going to be a, a, a very well established part of the industrial and uh, material supply chain so the uh, I would say that a big misconception with us is that we're suffering some sort of delays and so forth. Obviously, it's frustrating when things don't go as fast as you want or we're used to in, say, Australia or operating in Africa or South America or wherever. But um, we actually haven't suffered delays. We put in our permits you know, several years ago and we were told it would be several years until you find out what's going on. The only probably downer is that there's... Uh, uncertainty unlike a lot of countries where there's a prescribed amount of things meaning if you do steps one two three we will tick off on number four for you so as long as you comply you'll get it in sweden it's more like we'll send us your package of information we'll review it we'll tell you what we do and don't like and then you send it back again and tell you know it's a very iterative sort of process and at the end you don't really know they have to make a decision on what's best for sweden so um yeah they see this as a very serious and long-term opportunity for them but also they want to obviously mitigate any risks um, so we're in that process with them um, I would say it's gone pretty well so far back in June the submissions for objections as it were or people putting in submissions for the uh, from stakeholders to the project closed and we had positive submissions as well as the usual negative ones but importantly we had some really key government authorities make statements that were far beyond what we expected in support for the project or in in essentially saying that the, the project could go ahead if you mitigate against these things which were all things that we had already suggested we were we would do so the idea of mining for half a year for example um, that was actually our idea that wasn't imposed on us that we suggested that with this super high grade ore we only have to mine for a short time it's not a big volume so you just you know grab it whack it in a shed and then you can mill from it all year that sort of thing so these were things we thought would help the overall situation and uh so that's going quite well but we don't find out for sure until um yeah next next year early next year um there'll be a decision made which will give that strong direction of which way um you know they, they're going it doesn't mean it's the end of that process um there may be some need for some information or some other process that's happening, but you'll get obviously your big picture. And so we're in this, um, it's an environment, land and environmental court process, and they come out to the site, they look at what you're doing, they speak to local stakeholders and things like that, and then they'll have a hearing, and that hearing is expected in the first quarter of uh, next year. 
Um, but yeah, we we certainly have reason to be confident based on the years of work we've done and based on the situation in Sweden right now and in Europe generally, that they want critical materials to not be imported, that they have a domestic battery industry that's growing fast. They have had uh, changes of um, certain ministers and there's a, a government election underway uh, this month. Um, there's been a change in in the, the whole Russian situation with, with Ukraine has also provided an impetus for them to become more, um, uh, there's a, a new dynamic they haven't had since, in all the time I've been there. And it's it's about setting up new supply chains to make themselves more independent. Um, so while, while there may be delays to that, the difference with Europe, I think, compared to everywhere else is the problem with Europe is it's a bunch of different countries. It's not one thing. Um, so it's not like America where they can just go bang, bang, bang and make a legislation change and everyone everyone gets gets their check. Um, with Europe, it's obviously a little bit harder than that. But the good thing is that in Europe, it is a it is this long-term sort of cultural and social environment. It's a network of everything from R&D up to legislation, all heading for uh, electrification of transport. So, so it's a you know it's a it's a it's a big it's a big fluffy pillow of stuff. So while it may not have much form at times, it's it's still very comfy. <laughs> it's, it's gonna it's gonna be big and fluffy for a long time. Uh, so yeah, so this was all we thought just a compelling business that if you were to be a super high grade, super good margins, vertically integrated outside Asia, where would it be for long term investment? Um, you know, safety. Uh, then, then this this would be it. It's east, the deposits east of the mountains. It's it's uh, in a mining district already. It's an area that's been uh, mined a bit before. It's only three k's off our bitumen highway. It's twenty k's away from a railway line that goes to the ports. Um, you've got local battery makers. We're only one to two days drive from our customers. That's pretty unique in in the battery material world. <laughs> Um, you've got to normally ship your lithium out of Australia. It's got to be shipped somewhere or graphite from any country. It's got to be shipped somewhere else. Um, but to actually drive, mine and process and, and have your anode production within one to two days drive of your customers is quite valuable for this, these sorts of materials. So, yeah. And just finally... You're obviously the founder and the managing director, but you're also Telga's largest shareholder too. I'd love just to hear any final reflections that you have, why you're most excited about the Telga opportunity and any final reflections for those holders out there. I think I think Telga from people inside is, is I'm not sure how well understood. Obviously, we're so restricted in so many things we, we talk about, but I think most people get enough bits of info that they can sort of work it out. So I, I think people on the inside get it. Uh, on the outside, I think that they think it's just another graphite company. They don't get the materials and the technology and they don't realise that we're, we're qualifying our materials with car customers now. That That's who our offtakes are with. It's not it's not years down the track. Uh, it's actually happening now. So, um, yeah, I think, I think also the fact that we've got silicon anodes as well, conductive additives, we've got other material technologies inside of us. That's why it's Telga Group. We've actually got lots of different battery material technologies that are based on graphitic material. I mean, silicon is still mostly graphitic material uh, for the for the anodes. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm excited about, we've got so much value we've created from these investments we've made. And now is the time when the market's gonna allow us to bring them out. I, th I think previously the market actually wasn't there. They weren't interested. They didn't know, they didn't understand. They did it for other metals in the battery. Because of their because of you know they're LME traded, they're more visible, there's lots of people doing them, so lots of people studied it. Not many people still today uh, know much about the anode supply chain and how things are made. Uh, there's only there's very little research or, or um, things published on it. So I think that the, the good times essentially are ahead of us, but the investments Telga's made should allow it to to grow rapidly when these thing boxes are getting ticked off. So yeah, I'm just excited about um, who wouldn't be excited about building something that's both important and valuable at the same time. That is the Telga Group story. It's ASX TLG. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit like, subscribe and turn your bell notifications on. Mark Thompson, it was a pleasure. Looking forward to catching up again soon. Thanks anytime. Cheers.